All right. Can everybody hear me? Yep. So just continuing on with Prasad's theme, we're going to have a, a written test at noon today. <laughs> just about day one. Is everybody cool with that? Amy's going to be doing the grades. And uh, I heard Amy yell out a couple times, that's wrong, that's wrong. So everybody better be prepared today at noon for their time. I'm joking. Um, how did everybody feel like yesterday went? Any, any thoughts about yesterday? Okay, so I will tell you, I've been at MetroStream for two years, and yesterday was the best day I ever had at, at MetroStream. And I would it was the interaction that we had as a group here, um, the networking. Um, you know, you heard Joe Martinez talk about this yesterday, the importance of us in this GRC space to network with each other and really to lean in both from a customer perspective and a partner perspective. And I thought everyone in this room did an awesome job with it. So uh, how about a round of applause here for everybody in the room for their participation yesterday. So moving forward, I um, want to just talk about our first presenter today. And um, I will just tell you, um, when I look at organizations, the best organizations in the world they have customers and partners that are pushing them and getting them better every day. And you know, customers have an opportunity and partners have an opportunity to help drive what your product is, what your service is, what your go-to-market strategy is. Our next presenter is here, Gavin Grounds. Come on up here. Gavin is a thought leader. He's somebody who keeps his finger on the pulse of the marketplace from a GRC perspective. Um, and he has been a person who has really helped us at Metrixtream get better every day. And, you know, we are excited to be able to continue that relationship so we can continue to evolve our product, our service, and our go-to-market strategy. Um, just from a background perspective with Gavin, Gavin currently is at Meta. Previously, he was at Verizon. Verizon is one of our biggest customers in the world. And previous to that, he was at HP. So it's my honor to, to have uh, an, an introduction today to Gavin to do the next presentation. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gavin. <clears throat> that intro cost me 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we've, we've, we're hearing a lot about automation in GRC. We're hearing a lot about AI, machine learning. So what we wanted to do is spend a little bit of time on, on really sharing a, a real life story in terms of how we've been able to use AI and, uh, and automation around uh, quantification, and specifically cyber risk quantification. So there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about um, th this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I always describe the quantification of cyber risk as being a prerequisite. Um, the prerequisite to really managing risk effectively. Uh, and through the session, what we'll also then talk about is what I actually mean by quantification and what I do not mean by quantification. I'll give you a little a bit of a heads up. What I do not mean is trying to calculate an annualized loss expectancy. So we'll spend a little bit of, a little bit of time on how we approach the quantification journey, if you like, in, in, in cybersecurity and technology risk in a quantitative fashion. The third section we'll talk about is, is, the, is the, an actual real how-to. So this is not going to be some kind of academic exercise where we talk about theory and kind of the art of the possible. We'll really talk about or, or share with you some highlights from, uh, from a case study uh, that was done on a, on a huge global implementation of the method. And then finally, just a little bit of kind of practical tips in terms of literally what we, each of us can do starting tomorrow. Um, or this afternoon, uh, after the sessions, um, it, it, to, to really make progress in this whole space of uh, cyber quantification. So first of all, just covering off why we need quantification as a prerequisite when it comes to managing the risk associated with cyber and technology. Now, by the way, you'll hear me use cyber and technology risk interchangeably, and that's quite deliberate. So when we're thinking about technology risk, for example, or information risk, we're not going to be exclusively talking about protecting ourselves from hackers or protecting ourselves from you know, your, your traditional kind of stereotypical approach around cyber, or, or thoughts, rather, around cyber risk, but really is the whole, the whole um, domain of technology-based risk and information risk. So the, the chart I'm sharing here, I think this, um, I know it's first thing in the morning. We said there was no more written quiz, quizzes or, or tests. But can anybody solve 
the equation there in the bottom right hand corner. If you can, I'll give you 50 pounds. <laughs> Basically, what we say when we look at the summation of technology risk or cyber risk, these are just some of the kind of characteristics, if you like, or the elements that would go into that calculation. So the capital R is risk. And what we're basically saying is, is that risk is, is essentially the risk assessment results with the vulnerability management results with the end of support life or end of service life, architectural and environmental considerations and regulatory scrutiny. But look at the way we measure those differently. So with risk assessment results, we're going to get negligent, minor, uh, significant, serious, or severe. And then with vulnerability management, of course, we get the usual low, medium, high, critical, and then we might use some other thing from our tool, uh, our vulnerability scanning tool that tells us you know, what the potential exploitability is. But then we have to factor in architectural considerations. So can anyone solve the equation? If it's a severe plus a medium plus amber, what is R equal to? And that is foundationally why we need risk quantification. Interesting thing, by the way, in most of the risk domains, we actually start with the numbers first, and then we produce the heat map. In our domain, in cyber and technology risk, we start with the heat map and then try to turn it into a number. Another reason, by the way, it's great being back here in England. You can probably hear by, by the accents I'm not originally from Texas, just in case that didn't come up clear enough yesterday. Um, so over the weekend, it was fantastic to have a roast dinner. Because it's a little bit different, in, at least in Texas anyway. So when I am at home, in the interest of risk management, I, um, I don't do the cooking. Because that would probably be a bad outcome for the family. So it would be Sunday roast, and my wife might say to me, uh, how hungry are you? My mind could be, oh, I'm pretty hungry. That's the CISO's equivalent of medium. So it doesn't really answer the question. So she said, no, seriously, how, how hungry are you? I don't know, I could probably eat, whew, maybe three pounds and 28 pence worth of potatoes, that'll do. That might be mathematically correct, but it still doesn't answer the question. What she really wants to know is how many potatoes do you want with your dinner? And that's the same when it comes to quantification. Most of us, are, just raise your hand, just a quick, quick survey. Did your company have to do some kind of urgent response to Log4j? So there's a good few hands going up. In terms of prioritizing which systems you addressed first, how many people looked at the annualized loss expectancy of that system as the deciding factor for prioritizing which one you fix first? So that is the point. And the point is this. Then when it comes to quantifying risk, calculating and analyzing the loss expectancy rarely answers the question. It answers certain questions, but rarely answers the question in terms of prioritization and what should matter to us the most. Now, having said that, just thinking about, again, the, the, the story, if you like, or the case for making quantification, and I know you weren't expecting this first thing in the morning. I'm sorry, all this algebra, having to do the test. On the left-hand side, we have, a, we have a, an algebraic statement that basically says A plus B must be less than C. So if A is one um, risk factor, and if B is another risk factor, and C is the business value. So if the business value is 12 million, and A plus B must be less than 12 million, if A is 10 million, what is the maximum allowable value of B? There is not a 50 pound prize, by the way. What is the maximum value or allowable value of B? If you're thinking two, you're almost right. Because A plus B must be less than C. If you're thinking 1.9 recurring, then that would be the answer. But the point is, we, we, can, we can do the math pretty much in our head. Same scenario, but we're going to use a qualitative method. Business value is still 12 million. If A is medium, what's the maximum allowable value for B? 
again, it becomes an unsolvable equation. So it's really just emphasizing the point why uh, quant being able to quantify risk in the technology risk and cyber risk domains is, is a prerequisite to success. Just some other principles that really help us when we think about risk management in this particular domain. Um, as, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, you know, several years ago I, I joined Verizon before I came to Meta. And I remember going through my draft scorecard. And, and, and it was a draft. And one of the objectives that was put on me was um, to reduce risk. And my response was absolutely no. My role is to advise and help optimize risk. Again, because when we think about it from a business perspective in any other risk domain, it is actually about risk optimization. It's not always about risk reduction. Now, some of these graphics, by the way, I'm using them very de deliberately. We see this hiker, um, and she's about to cross this ravine. If her sole objective was to reduce risk, she probably wouldn't cross using the rope bridge. So at best, it's going to take her however long it's going to take to go walk around the long way to get to the other side, or she's not going to get there at all. And that can be the same with risk management in business. We need to be able to decide how much risk we are willing to take in the context of the value that is being driven from, from the, the potential outcomes that we're looking for. The other thing, and I mentioned about um, it's not exclusively you know, calculated in an ALE, but it does help us to understand that when we have a, 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 quantif a quantification approach, how we can become much more effective at, at decision making. For example, if I have a business leader and that leader says, hey, I've got a $100 million opportunity here. If I say, well, this is a million dollars of risk wrapped up in that one, she might just say, well, I'll take it, thanks. I'll bag the 99. In the meantime, can you go ahead and try and drive that one million down to like a half a million, perhaps? Imagine the exact same conversation, though, and it's like, hey, I've got this opportunity, $100 million. And I say, yeah, but you've got seven criticals, three highs, and two mediums. There might be a different decision that gets made. Might be, wait, wait, wait. Can we get rid of those seven criticals first, then? Now, what we've just done by making that decision is we've at least diluted the net present value of that business opportunity. Because any revenue that we were about to realize has now been pushed, pushed out and delayed. The cash flow associated with cash coming in from that revenue generation has now been pushed out by a period of time. So we've literally diluted the net present value of that entire business initiative, and yet it's the exact same scenario. But in one hand, or on the one hand, we're speaking in terms of quantifiable measures, and on the other hand, we're speaking in terms of low, medium, high critical. So I mentioned earlier that ALE is rarely the answer to the question, and certainly is difficult if we're focusing on annualized loss expectancy, if that's the only me measure that we use for quantification, then it, it becomes difficult to make literally operational decisions. So the method, and I thought I'd share some of these highlights with you. If, if anyone's, a, this is not a plug, by the way, <laughs> but if you are a member of Gartner, you'll be able to pull these case studies from Gartner directly. So Gartner did a case study on the method that I designed and operationalized uh, when I was at Verizon. Um, later this afternoon, by the way, if you attend some of the uh, sessions that, that I'll, I'll be speaking in later with, uh, with a colleague of mine as well, will describe how this is almost like version three of its precursor over the last several years. Well, basically, the method is it, it's, it's essentially a points-based system. So think about, for example, when you're collecting air miles. Uh, you know, the more you travel, the more segments you fly, you get points added into your account. Uh, if you've got a credit card that's associated with your, your air miles, then you're going to get some points added into your account. So that's essentially what the model, well, the method is. It's not a relativity score. It's not a 1 through 10 or a 1 through 100. It's essentially a model that says that the more characteristics that we analyze, the more data that we analyze, then more points get added. So the way I would describe it is you think about 
like kind of two pillars, if you like, of, 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 of points. One pillar is what I call base risk, and the other pillar is what I call actionable risk. So I'll just talk about base risk first of all. Now, by the way, this is not all the elements that would go into calculating a base risk score, but it just gives you a kind of flavor and idea of the kind of considerations that you would, you would place on it. So for each asset, I want to say asset, by the way, I think it's also worth highlighting what I mean by asset and what I don't mean. When I use the phrase asset, I'm real, or the word asset, I'm talking about the thing of value. So an asset could be a product, it could be a service, it could be a process or a system that's mission critical. So it's really the overall en uh, entity, if you like, or the, the thing of value. When we think about IT or OT components, they are literally that, components. So let's use a, a simple example. Um, let's say if it's a, a payments collection platform, then the payments collection platform is the asset. That's the thing that is driving the value to the business. To deliver that value, we might have 50 virtual machines and three databases and some network architecture that, that sits underneath that. So those are the components, if you like, the IT components that essentially deliver the value for that asset. So when we think about the asset, then there are some kind of characteristics, if you like, that we can measure. So I mentioned, first of all, about what is the value of this asset. Maybe it's revenue generating. We say, well, how much revenue? We say, well, this particular system is generating $5 million in revenue. So we're going to award it points because of its revenue generation characteristic. Now, by the way, with this method, what we don't do is say, well, $5 million equals 5 million points. What it allows us to do is to use awarding points based on the significance of that revenue. So in your business unit, $5 million could be a rounding error, or it could be a one day's fluctuation in foreign exchange rates. For your business, $5 million could be everything, but we're in the same company. So what it allows us to do is, is award points based on the significance of that revenue to that particular business unit. We can also look at other characteristics like strategic directionality. Is this asset, is this something that we're investing in, that we're building out on? Is it something that we're, we're holding steady? Is it something that we're going to deprecate over time and, and basically sunset? Um, so some of the examples as to why that's valuable is when you think when we, when we bring a new product or a new service into the market, the revenue associated with that product or service might be relatively small compared to the predecessor or the preceding products and services that we have. But our expectation over time is that the future revenue opportunity for that particular asset is probably even more significant than the current asset that's in operation. So it allows us to award points based on future directionality. Other aspects of base risk, so we think about the, you know, how significant it is. Maybe it's mission critical and doesn't generate one cent in revenue. An example of uh, a system like that could be a payroll system. If we don't pay our people, we're probably not going to be operating for very long. And so we, we could say, well, the payroll system is mission critical. So we can award points based on that. Some of the other characteristics that we would look at to award points would then be things like architectural considerations. You know, how exposed in an untreated fashion is this asset? So is it internet facing? If it is, we're going to reward points. How many API connections does it have? What kind of API connections? Is it push? Is it pull? Are they throttled? Are they connected to third parties? So really, when you think what we're describing there is the, the, the attack surface. But we're taking the attack surface and awarding points based on the attack surface or the architectural considerations, so now it becomes measurable. And the third aspect is legal and regulatory exposure. Some of you have heard me say this before, and I mean with all respect, but you can view a regulator as a threat actor. So we have some actors that are malicious, and we have other actors that are non-malicious. Inside a threat, inside is a either malicious or it's non-malicious and it's accidental. So why do I say that we could look at maybe a regulator as a, as a potential threat actor? Well, if you think about the definition of a threat actor, a threat actor is anything or any entity or anyone that can impede a business process. Well, an APT, an advanced persistent threat, can definitely impede a business process. 
uh, an insider, accidental or deliberate, can impede a business process. If we fail to meet our regulatory obligations, we are impeding our own business processes. So when we think about that, that in that context then, we can say, well, the more exposed this asset is to regulatory scrutiny or legal obligations to, a, to, a, to an enterprise customer, for example, then we're going to award points. And the net result of that is we, we, we get that, all those points together and we can essentially, for all of our assets, say the one that's got the highest number of points is the thing that is most valuable to us and that we care about the most. And the thing that is at the bottom of the pile might be this system that runs the menu in the cafeteria. We care about it if we're hungry, <laughs> but you know, it's not going to um, have a huge impact to, to the business. So what the base risk that does then for us is we can take the exact same approach and when we think about what does that mean for um, actionable risks, I said so there's two pillars. One is the base risk and now we've created literally a stack rank of the things that matter to us the most and the things that are most exposed. And that's a numeric stack rank. It's not a one through a hundred, it's not relativity, it's just you can add as many points as, as a system, uh, as you have systems. We think that about um, actionable risk. Actionable risk is something that you can do something about if you choose to in the short term. So we talked about, for example, about vulnerabilities. You know, if we've got vulnerabilities in the environment, we say, well, you know, you got, you, you, and this is where you, we have to <laughs> take that rating of low, medium, high, critical and convert it into a numeric representation. But we also can take exploitability into consideration from two perspectives. Number one, from the perspective of if our vulnerability management platform, if that tool already gives us some indication of an, of an exploitability score, so in other words, hey, this has got a vulnerability, but there's no, there's no kits out there yet. Or if there are kits available, exploit kits, then they'll give you a score that says, well, it's now potentially exploitable because there are, or more exploitable because there are exploit kits. But we can put that then in the context of the base risk because the base risk score is giving us an indication architecturally as to how exposed it is. We can also award points based on any um, measurable control that we have in our control framework. So another example, uh, is this platform in scope to have MFA? And if through the scans or through the through configuration to, uh, check tools that we have, we find that it's not subscribed to MFA, then we will award actionable risk points to it because there's a control that is missing. Or it could be that, we, that on, on discovery we find that there are local admin accounts in this particular OS. And maybe that's not consistent with the way we want to operate the environment, so we'll award points because that particular control is now less effective. So essentially what we're doing is using the, ex the existing tools that we have that measure how effective our various controls are, and we're rewarding points on the actual risk side every time we find a, a control that has become ineffective or less effective. What that then allows us to do is a couple of things. Number one, it allows us to set a risk appetite. Again, just a quick poll for the audience. How many of us have heard the phrase or even said the phrase when we're thinking about you know, cyber risk in particular, well, the risk appetite is set by the board of directors. Has anybody heard that phrase? Big show of hands. Anybody ever sat down with a board member and said, what is your cyber risk appetite? Right, so, so the, it's really not for the board to establish the cyber risk appetite. They help define what the overall risk appetite is for the operations of the business. But for the cyber risk appetite, that's for us as practitioners, that is up to us to partner as an advisor with the business owner or the P&L owner so they can establish a, a, a risk appetite that is well informed. And that then just becomes part of the overall operational risk, if you like, of the business or, or the enterprise that we're, we're working in. So think back to uh, what I talked about with the, with the base risk. And we said the, one, the, one, the asset with the highest base risk score is the thing that we care the most about and in an untreated fashion is the most exposed. 
So what that means allows us to say, well, let's say if I'm at the top of that pile, if my application or my platform is at the top of that pile, then on the actionable risk, I should have the lowest budget for actionable risk. So you might say to me, well, Gavin, you're only allowed to have 15 points to play with on your actionable side because your asset is scoring top of the pile. You might be given 40 points to play with because you've, you've got a lower base risk score and therefore the potential impact of the business is by nature lower and or the value might be higher, but the exposure is lower. So it allows us to set the risk appetite of the actionable things um, or the actionable issues, if you like, that we need to address based on the, the true value and true exposure of the asset itself. What that then allows us to do, and this is just illustrative, but we, we literally can then see, let's say if I've got a budget of 15 points that I'm allowed to play with, and I, I wake up this morning and the, the dashboard is telling me I'm at 25 points. I'm like, what, what happened? I'm 10 points over budget. But then I can literally drill down and say, what are those contributing factors that are now pushing me over budget? And I can then look at this risk as an actionable risk and decide, you know what, there's nothing I can do about uh, item number one today, not even this week. But I can do something around items number three, four, and six. And I can actually see how those actions and activities will affect my, my risk score, my risk budget. So that allows me to operate within budget. So just to kind of wrap up these, a few of these thoughts and really how to, you know, how, how to accelerate, you might say. One of the things is, um, is really just to leverage what we've already got. I think it was Roosevelt who said, you go to war with the army you have. Well, we go to war with the data that we have. As CISOs, as risk officers, we may have um, five or six different dashboards. My car has got one dashboard. The plane that I flew over in wasn't a military thing, so it basically had one cockpit too. So if we push the dashboard to one side and think, oh, what's the data that sits underneath that? The data that feeds those dashboards, that data is available to us today. Again, publicly knowable information from the, from the study that you could read at Gartner. When I arrived at Verizon several years ago, we were doing about 500 risk assessments a month. When I left, we were doing 13.1 million risk assessments a month because we wrote it as code. And it wasn't just the, 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 the power was not in the fact that we were running that many risk assessments. We are basically processing more than two billion data points in any 24 hour period, and every asset was getting its score refreshed every 15 minutes, because it was all as code. But what the, the power was that it was saying not only, hey, this is your score, but the reasons why it's your score, and the actions that are recommended prioritized actions that can be taken. So when we think about going to war with the data we have, we, can, we literally can go to war, if you like, and, and, and start a quantification journey based on the data that's already readily available to us in the, um, in, in the systems that we have deployed already. Now, you, I've been asked three times since I've been here on this visit, where's the accent from? That's another 50 pound opportunity right there. But um, my family are from Limerick. And so when I was a kid, they, my, my nan, she was, a, she was an amazing woman. And sometimes she would get stopped in the street and someone would say, can, can you, do you know how, how do I get to, uh, how do I get down to the castle? And she'd be like, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. <laughs> and the person would just look puzzled and then she just laughed just like we all just did. Um, and I never did know if she really thought that way or if it was to, to actually get a, a, a giggle. But when you think about it, it is a strange thing to say, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. The person's like, what? this is where I am. But equally, I think we've all said some similarly nonsensical things like, well, you've got to start somewhere. Here. And it's the same with this journey. We start from where we are. So whatever asset inventory we have, that's where we start. 
Some companies, you know, I've met with a lot of people who say, well, we don't have a, we don't have an up-to-date CMDB, we don't have an up-to-date asset register, we don't even know half the assets that we've got. My yet-to-be-conceived grandchildren will retire before most companies get an up-to-date asset inventory. It's been a lifelong message, if you like, in our domain about issues around asset management, asset inventory. But we start with what we do know. And that's one of the mantras that I found to be super uh, helpful in this journey is, and it goes like this, start with what you do know, improve based on what you could know, and always aspire to what you should know. So start with what we do know. If we've got an asset inventory that, tells, that describes 50% of the environment, that's where we start. Because we can't start anywhere else except there. You might say, well, we don't have a good map and we don't really understand what our priority business assets are. We have a sales ledger. We can see where the revenue flows are coming from. We can see which products and services are driving them, the best uh, sources of revenue or the highest yield, the highest margins. If we're thinking about, well, what about the uh, mission critical systems? Well, where are we spending our money? So we have our purchase ledger. So the point is, that's where we are. So just some key takeaways. Our objective cannot be exclusively to reduce risk. Our job is to advise to help optimize risk. And we can leverage all of the data and everything that we do know to help with that advisement, if you like. Annualized loss expectancy is not always the answer. But certainly low, medium, high, and relativity scales are equally impractical. When we come with, a, with something that's got empirical numeric scoring, that can truly drive informed business and decision making. And we can only be on the path that we're on so far. So whatever direction we're headed in today with, with our, our plan, if you like, that's the direction we continue on. And then we can adjust our path over time. So thank you very much. Um, I know we don't have time for Q&A in this session, but I am going to be around for the whole day. So we look forward to spending some time with you all later. As I say, we have some follow-up sessions this afternoon. In the meantime, enjoy the conference, and thanks for your time.